All right, Matthew chapter 8. So uh, <clears throat> we just finished a long three-chapter discourse called the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. It's one of how many discourses in the book of Matthew? One of five. Um, so what we're going to do is we, we just finished discourse, and now we got two chapters of non-discourse, and then we jump back into a one-chapter discourse after that. So this is what you can come to expect is some discourse, some other stuff that's not discourse related, although there's, you know, Jesus is talking throughout it. Uh, but it's not a long, sustained teaching. And then we'll jump back into. But I just wanted to remind us what the tenor of the finish of the discourse was when Jesus had finished those words. Remember, that's the trigger for the end of that discourse. The crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So the end of this sermon leaves the people amazed at his teaching his teaching was different. His message was different. His whole ministry, we will come to find, is different. And it was all amazing. Okay? So, he's coming down off the mountain. Uh, I haven't really talked about this, but I'll, I'll, point, I'll be pointing it out as we go through the rest of Matthew. Uh, there are five discourses. We've talked about that. There's also people that count the mountains. Um, if, do you remember the reason I suggested we count the discourses at five? It was so long ago, I know. Yes, it was, if we're comparing Jesus, if Matthew was comparing Jesus to this Moses character, Moses gave five words from God. There were five books, and there were five messages that he brought down off of a mountain. There are people that count not just the discourses and try and tie that back into Moses's, a, a tie into Moses, but also when it mentions Jesus goes up on a mountain. That's, that's Moses' language. Because Moses did the best part of his ministry on a mountain. It was one mountain and he went up it multiple times. Sometimes he took people with him, sometimes he didn't. He was up there by himself for a while and he would come back down. That was his time with God, right? And then he would come back down and interact with the people as that intermediary between the two, right? So as Jesus goes up on a mountain, don't just uh, assume that's by chance, okay? You need, to, you need to think in these terms, if I'm a Jewish reader of this New Testament, and I have the Old Testament as my background, I know that Old Testament fairly well, and I know Moses, as God's prophet, goes up on the mountain. And important things happen when they go up on the mountain. What was the first mountain in uh, Matthew's? Back in four? Temptation. Mount of Temptation. Second mountain was the discourse. He came down off the mountain. That's right here. He came down off the mountain. So that's mountain number two. We'll point those out. They'll, they'll be obvious now that I've mentioned it this much as we go. Okay? Let's talk about organization. We're talking big picture now, okay? So I know you want me to jump in and talk about the leper. We'll get to him. We're going to spend a lot of time on the leper. Um, but right now we're just going to cruise right by him as a part of a bigger picture. So organization. Uh, this is hopefully going to be very helpful to you because we have, again, I, we do a really good job of studying little, we call them pericopes, little story segments. And we usually break these story segments, when we get to this part of Matthew, into each individual healing or miracle event. Okay? And so we get to know these events really well, but we don't know how they fit together. So that's why I'm going to try and uh, supply for you right now, try and convince you of uh, at least what I'm seeing. Now I've highlighted in green to begin with. My proposal is this. Matthew has organized, and I know it's Matthew organizing this way because Luke and the other gospel writers do it differently. They have same similar content, but they organize it differently. So Matthew is doing this on purpose. He organizes in the next two chapters, three sets of three, followed by, a, each set is followed by a call. What do I mean by that? There's going to be 
Uh, we're going to start here, and I'm going to show you three stories of miracles. And then it's going to be followed by a call to discipleship, a deepening call to discipleship. And then, after that call to discipleship, we're going to go through another set of three miracle stories, and then a call to discipleship. Some of this goes into the next chapter, and you're not familiar with the stories yet. And then lastly, three are you following? <laughs> miracle stories followed by a call <coughs> to deepening discipleship. Okay? So let me just point that out. That's what we're going to look at on the screen. I've color-coded them, and I'm going to go uh, fairly fast, but slow enough for you to notice. So you see green here, right? It looks blue to me at my angle, but it's, it's green when it goes straight on. So you either see blue or green. And it says a leper came to him. Miracle number one. It's a healing miracle, okay? A centurion came to him. Do you see that? Miracle number two story in the first set. Jesus came into Peter's home. Miracle number three story in the first set. What's next? If I'm not leading you on. A call to discipleship. Oh, look, the, the prick beheading is discipleship tested. Uh, how convenient, right? Okay, so a scribe comes and asks a question. Another disciple comes, asks a question. Jesus gives two answers. And then what are we doing? I switch colors on you. Should be purple if you're straight on. Or light purple from the side. Okay, they came to him. Who's that? Disciples in the boat. Okay. Miracle number one in the second set. Two men who are demon possessed. Miracle number two in the second set. They brought him a paralytic. Miracle number three in the second set. What's next? Called Matthew to be his disciple. Now, notice something. What's the language used here? He said to him, follow me. Does that look familiar to? He said to him, follow me. Do you see the repetition? Yes. Okay. So now we're done with purple. We're done with the second set. I switched back. Oh, the, the call to discipleship is longer. It's this whole section that goes down through questioning about fasting. And then I'm back to green for my color. Synagogue official came and bowed before him. Miracle number one in the third set. Two blind men followed him. Miracle number two in the third set. And a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. Miracle number three in the third set. What's next? A call to his disciples. Right? Then what do we do? we go into our next discourse. So Matthew is organizing very deliberately his gospel. And as we go through the next two weeks and look at these two chapters, uh, beginning at 8.1, we're going to hop back to the leper, okay? As we go through these two chapters, we're going to talk about the individual stories and we'll bring meaning to those, hopefully, uh, some of them, not all of them, we don't have time. But I want you to understand a bigger picture, and that's what I'm going to be emphasizing as we close tonight, as we get to the end of this first set. I'm going to try and bring some of that idea in, and how is that practical to us as readers today? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so Jesus came down from the mountain, mountain number two. Large crowds followed him. Sometimes Jesus is doing miracles with large crowds around him, and sometimes he seems to be doing miracles by uh, just he and another person. Um, this leper incident, it's not really clear the way it's written because it says large crowds followed him and the very next and a leper came to him. But then he eventually tells this leper not to tell anybody and to go straight to the temple, which suggests that maybe there weren't that many people around and lepers weren't supposed to be around large crowds anyway. So we just suggest to you that um, at least the context of 
uh, this leper incident might suggest that it was done uh, with just maybe a few people there. So uh, also before we get into the next two chapters, I wanna ask, uh, pro propose a question. Um, as we follow Matthew's gospel past chapters eight and nine, and we'll see Jesus interacting with more people as we go, I want to be asking the question every time Jesus interacts with somebody, what is the state of that person prior to meeting Jesus? Okay? Uh, I think there's an assumption out there in uh, modern day readership that anytime Jesus introduces himself to somebody and somebody comes to faith in Jesus, that terminology, where they follow him, where they call him Lord, I think there's an assumption that that person that's coming to faith, it's a brand new faith that's being created. Okay? I think there's an assumption that, um, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Hey, we've got a new Christian here. And I don't think we can assume that as readers of the Bible. If you go back in the Old Testament, there's this idea of a remnant. A, uh, a believing group of people, uh, started with Adam and Eve, by the way, that has been present on this earth at sometimes at great numbers of people and sometimes small numbers of people, but there's been a remnant alive throughout time and history on this earth since the beginning. That's kind of a biblical presentation. There's always somebody that's faithful following God. Now, sometimes those are not necessarily the people, and we learn this in the book of Matthew, it's not necessarily the people that look like the faithful, right? That's Jesus' whole message is the Pharisees look good on the outside, but they're not really the faithful. Which begs the question, where are the faithful? If the Pharisees aren't the faithful, and that's what Jesus' message is, then it kind of suggests there are faithful, right? The whole Sermon on the Mount was blessed are you. He's talking to somebody, I hope, right? I mean, somebody fits into that category of being the blessed, the people that believe unto true faith, a faith that can only really be discerned by God himself, right? It's not an exterior thing that you can look at, although there is some fruit that's produced, right? Trees, two types of trees in the last chapter. So as we come into this section where Jesus is actually introducing himself and interacting with people, I don't think we can assume anything about these people prior to him, prior to reading this story. We can't assume that these are just blank slate. They don't have any faith at all. What we will come to find out is a lot of these people are Old Testament believers in a promise that was presented there of a coming Messiah. And they read their Old Testament, they came to a saving faith through that Old Testament message, and they're expecting a Messiah to show up. And so when that Messiah does, you would expect that group of people, the remnant, alive in Jesus' day, you would expect them to respond very positively to Jesus' message and his actions. And then if you see a negative response to Jesus' message and action, that might be suggesting a heart condition that's not open and receptive. Does that make sense? Okay, enough about that. I'll make little comments as we go. But that is a good, no matter where you are in the Bible, it's a good question to be asking. What's the condition of this person's soul prior to meeting Jesus or hearing about Jesus? And oftentimes the text will give you clues to let you know. Because it's written after the fact. Right? They're not recording it as they're going. It's written well after the fact. And so they bring those points out. Okay. 8-1. 8-2. Uh, Boy, we're cruising already. Look at that. <laughs> leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, let's talk about lepers for just a second. Um, this particular leper comes in a, in a worship posture. He's bowing down. You see that? And do you notice anything about what this leper says specifically or how he says it? It seems to be a three-point prayer. What's the first point? Acknowledging Lord. Acknowledging Lord. Some of you already know where I'm going with this, I hope. 
Number two, if you are acknowledging a will that's not my own. Number three, acknowledging a debt that needs to be repaired. Lord, if you are willing, I have a debt that I can't take care of that needs to be forgiven, right? What does that sound like? It's, a, it's an application of the template of the Lord's Prayer. Is it complete? Does it have all the features? No, but it has a lot of them. And for this leper, he's following a template. Whether he realizes it or not, he is approaching God, he is acknowledging a will that's more superior to than his own, and he's acknowledging that Jesus is in a kingdom, and he wants that kingdom as it functions in heaven to now take place in his own life and repair his condition of deficiency. Does that make sense? We're going to see this again, so I just want to point that out as we go through. Um, so he, he has the ask, and uh, Jesus comes up, and coming out of the Old Testament, there was two ideas, two things that were considered the most defiling things. Leper was number two on the list. A leper, because he's in the realm of the dead, okay? He's on his way to death. Usually lepers didn't uh, come out of this condition. Uh, there's not many lepers mentioned in the entirety of scripture. Uh, I kind of did some research, research on that this last week. But there's not a whole lot of lepers being cured. Um, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Jesus comes up and what's Jesus' response? He touches him. Now what's curious about that? He's unclean. Yeah, he is an unclean. This is, this is number two on the list of most defiled. What's number one? A, a dead corpse. In the next two chapters, Jesus will come in contact with both, okay? As well as many other situations. Jesus comes up and touches him. Uh, we closed out uh, the two houses on the two foundations last week. We closed out and proposed to you that this is a presentation of two houses, two temples, right? It's the Herod's second temple that stood at the time of Jesus, the remodeled temple. And it's the temple of Jesus, who he is, his body himself. And what's interesting is if a leper were to go into Herod's second temple, what would happen to the temple? Do you know? It would be in a state of defilement. The temple itself can get defiled. The second temple. The physical building. But here, you have a competition going on between two temples. And here you have Jesus touching the leper. And the question is, does Jesus become defiled? when he comes in contact with sin? No, he doesn't. What is the result of Jesus coming in contact with sin? It's the complete sanctification of whatever he touches. His condition goes into the defilement and cures it. In the other temple, it's the other way around. It's the condition of the defiler that comes in and defiles the temple. But what we're, I think what one thing Matthew is doing is he's, he's presenting these two temples in a number of different scenarios. And he's showing the superiority. When he gets to chapter 12, he'll actually come out and say, Jesus himself will say, one better than the temple is here. Right? And he's talking about Herod's second temple. Something better than that is here. And what is he referring to? It's in himself. Right. Okay. So we're heading to that chapter 12 statement with some of these other things uh, that come along the way. So he touches him. Um, <clears throat> lepers were cut off from the temples. Rabbis usually wouldn't even travel in crowds because there was a chance that somebody that was unclean could come up and randomly touch them and then make the rabbis defiled. Jesus doesn't have that concern, okay? 
Matthew is showing Jesus as one better than those who came before. Okay, there's something special about this Jesus. Um, some famous lepers out of the Old Testament. Uh, Moses, did you know Moses was had a, a bout of leprosy just for a short, put his hand in, hand in. It was short, but okay. He's a leper that was healed. Miriam had leprosy for a short period of time, about a week or eight days or so, seven days. Uh, there's a foreigner by the name of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, there's three or four others. And then we get to um, the New Testament, and there's several unnamed lepers, uh, this one being one of them. He's unnamed. Uh, there's a group of 10 lepers that Jesus heals in Luke 17, uh, verses 11 through 21. One of those is a Samaritan. He's given at least a context. The others are Jews. Just all this to say, the healing of leprosy is a dramatically rare event in Scripture. Okay? I want to point out to you, this is a model of Herod's second temple. I don't know if you can notice or read this. This is Chamber of Lepers. Okay? So this is where the temple stuff happened past this gate. Out here is a courtyard. And there's a place to store some wood and oil and a place for Nazarites to congregate. And then a chamber of lepers. And this is a place not for lepers to congregate because they can't come into the temple while they're lepers. But this is a place that if you were a leper and you became clean, there's a procedure in the Old Testament that Jesus hints to, right? Now, the book of Moses, there's a procedure that you were to follow, that you were to go back to the priest, you were to present yourself to the priest, and they had a ceremony, a procedure that lasted eight days that they had to go through to verify that you were actually clean and could be taken off the leper list because they had a leper list, okay? They have been identified as lepers, and it's the priests that would have to go through this process of identifying. The priests didn't heal anybody. They just identified the ones that were healed. So here, Jesus touches him. He says, I am willing to cleanse you. And he was immediately, his leprosy was clean. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, go show yourself to the priest, present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. To who? To the priest. So here's, I want you to catch the irony of this. What do the priests think of Jesus? They don't think he's from God at all. In fact, they think he's blaspheming. That is eventually what will lead to his death, is their consideration of that. And yet, here they are back in the temple, and a former leper shows up and says, hey, I've been cured. Now, coming out of the Old Testament, what you might not realize, the only time lepers are cured in the Old Testament is through the hand of a prophet of God. Elisha heals Naaman, makes him clean. And so when a leper shows up in that chamber of lepers, after he's identified as clean outside the city and he's allowed eight days later to come into the temple and a sacrifice being given there, that chamber likely has not been used before because this temple was actually built shortly before Jesus' birth, in the last part of the B.C. centuries, or in the years. So this leper shows up. The priests likely don't even, they're probably having to go back to their text to say, okay, what is it we do again? Because we haven't done this in a, ever here, right? And so what's the logical question that a priest might ask a person that comes up and claims, to be cured of leprosy. What, how did this happen? And what's being told to them? This man, Jesus, cleansed me of my leprosy. 
which says to them, if they know their Old Testament, who's in the land? There's a prophet of God in the land doing God's work. It's a testimony to the priests. These are the same priests that later will be looking for false prophets, false testimony to come forward to testify against Jesus. Do they have testimony at the time they're trying to kill Jesus of who Jesus is? They already do. That makes it seem even worse. <laughs> because Jesus cured more than one leper. He cured 10 at one time. One of them was a Samaritan and may not have ended up back in Jerusalem, but nine of them, the whole context is they didn't stop and thank him. They ran off to Jerusalem to do what he told them to do, go to the temple. Can you imagine nine people showing up at one time, all of them saying the same thing? Jesus Christ healed me. He is the Messiah. He is one better than Moses. He is one better than Elisha. The prophets out of the Old Testament that did that same ministry. We're not going to make it uh, all the way through chapter. <laughs> um, well, let's see what we can do. Um, story number two begins in verse five. Jesus entered uh, Capernaum. He's in the north there. And he comes uh, upon this centurion. Who's a centurion? Is he a Jewish man? No, he's a Roman. He's a Roman in charge of 100 soldiers. And yet, uh, we know from Luke's account of this that this centurion uh, had great favor among the Jews. He had helped uh, contribute money towards the building of the synagogue in Capernaum, the one that we went into that had the black basalt um, uh, foundation. So it was likely this centurion that um, helped at least bring that uh, synagogue in Capernaum to fruition. And he has an interesting conversation. We're not going to go all the way through, but he understands authority in a way that nobody else in Israel, that's the comment Jesus makes, understands. He says, you don't even have to come. You don't even have to come visit. Just say the word. I understand how authority works, and I understand you have authority. Now let's just take a look at what he says. Um, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And then he goes on to this on through this is there anything sounding familiar about that interchange how does he start lord is he acknowledging yes. yeah he, he's acknowledging position in a in a kingdom and he is the leader right and he's saying if if you want you can do this if it's your will you don't even have to come to my place with great amazement. He marveled, it said. That's quite an undertaking to have Jesus marvel at your faith. Uh, Peter, mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law. This is number three in the first set, right? The third miracle in the first set, followed by, uh, we're going to do our best to get through the first set here uh, very quickly. So Jesus came into Peter's home. This is in Capernaum as well. Um, I had a fever this last week, so this really, um, I also had a dry patch on my wrist, uh, which I thought may be leprosy, so this really hit home this week, uh, this whole <laughs> message that uh, Jesus is my healer. Uh, when Jesus came into Peter's home, mother-in-law's lying there sick. He touched her again, notice that. And it's not that she slowly got better. She took some time to recover that I've had to experience this week, recovery time. Even though I'm getting better, I'm not quite there yet. She pops right up, which means this is a miraculous healing. This is not just a medicinal healing. This is miraculous in nature. She got up and waited on him. It mentions that other people are, are um, healed through the end of that. And then, let's just take a look at these two questions that these, uh, these two people ask. It's this call to deeper discipleship. What Matthew is doing is he's saying, here's Jesus' words, Matthew 5 through 7. 
Here are Jesus' deeds, eight and nine, this week and next week. And hearing those words and seeing these deeds should lead you to a deeper following of this man. That was the original message, but when did Matthew write this? Well after the fact. So he's not considering first and foremost and only the original hearers of these conversations, but Matthew is constructing it for his audience, his original audience, saying, you've heard his words, you have now seen his actions, and so you too as a reader, and I would invite you that it's actually happening to you as you read it, you are being invited to a deeper discipleship as we read through this account. There's a scribe, which is very interesting, verse 19, that came to him that says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus has this weird response. Foxes have dens. I mean, is this kind of just out of left field? Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man, Son of Man uh, we'll visit again next week, but that's out of Daniel 7, that's a title that has just a boatload of meaning, meaning in it. Uh, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But it's Jesus saying, I'm going to follow you anywhere. And what's his response? Okay. It may not be as comfortable as where you are. I don't know if I like that. Another disciple, verse 21, says to him, Lord, let me go take care of and bury my father. Now this... It sounds a little, the response may seem a little abrupt by Jesus. It's likely we read this and think, oh, his father has died and all he wants to do is go and bury his father. It's likely not the case. The father was probably doing um, well, still alive, but getting older. And his request was, let me go until that situation is done. Let me bury him because it's coming and Jesus' response is, you might have to reprioritize your relationships. To follow me, this call to deeper discipleship says, you need to be willing to reprioritize your lifestyle based on kingdom demands you may not have a place to lay your head. And you may need to reprioritize your relationships. Because the ones that you hold dear may not be the concern of the kingdom that you are joining. Now, those, those are really good if you just leave them there with those people. Because I'm not a scribe and I don't know who this other guy was, but you know, who cares really? Let's move on. But if what I'm proposing is at, all, is at all applicable to us today, which isn't a big stretch, right? <laughs> it's that same message that I propose Matthew is formulating for you. As you read through this account of Jesus, you hear his words about a choice of two kingdoms. You hear, his, you see his deeds his healing touch that he brings to people's lives. And if that's inviting, and you're wanting to join that kingdom, the first call to discipleship, coming out of this first three miracle set, is you may have some things to reprioritize in your life. And I don't know what those are for you. I'm dealing with those in my own life, and that's taken enough time but as I look out, I know that you're not different than me in the sense that you have priorities and God is going to be challenging your priorities as well. Is it okay that you may not have a place to lay your head? I don't even know what that means in your situation. But it means you might have to reprioritize something. What relationships might God ask you to reprioritize? 
as we go through, we're going to see calls to discipleship, and it's going to be a very similar message. We're going to be wowed by miracles, and then we're going to be encouraged to go deeper. Okay? So as we go through these two chapters, that's going to be the progression. So next week, we're going to hit those first two, or the second set of three, and let's just walk through as we finish what those are going to be. Uh, it's going to be the great storm on the sea, that's number one, and then casting out the demons, number two, and then we'll be in chapter nine. So we're going to hit that, those last two, the, the first two miracles of the second set, the remainder of chapter eight, and then we'll move on to chapter nine. Okay? But as you study chapter nine, I want you to start back in chapter eight and read that as a set of three that leads to discipleship call and then expect that last set of three. It's not really in your notes, but you've heard this, so you know to look for it. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, let me close in prayer. Um, I feel like I've, uh, I've been challenged. <laughs> um, and these are not easy words to hear, depending on where you're at and how you've prioritized your life. Um, the call of Jesus is a life-changing event. And you can't just have all the benefits of the touch and the healing without the commitment and the willingness to join a kingdom and prioritize a will that's not your own. So let's, uh, let's just pray with that. God, thanks for this message. Thanks for the chance to be challenged. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for uh, having the wisdom, being given the wisdom by the Holy Spirit to organize his gospel message in such a way that we get to see who you are, we get to hear what you say, and then we get to be challenged to follow you along with all of those that were alive there with you. So God, thanks for your uh, superintending this process for not just the scripture reaching our ears, but uh, after it gets into our head and into our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.